Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. Episode 126. One, I think, is more bank-to-bank distribution. And second is the distribution being very manual in nature. We definitely see new trends, new structures of the deals, new investor markets, and new players coming into the secondary market. I'm Mark Abrams, Head of Trade Finance at Trade Finance Global. We're in Abu Dhabi at IPFA's 49th Annual Trade and Forfeiting Conference. I'm delighted to be joined by Nishit Kumar, Senior Director, Head of Loan Syndication, Sales and Distribution at Mashrek, and Kamola Birohujeva, Executive Director, Head of America's Distribution at JP Morgan. Today, we're talking about trade distribution, state of the art or an age old dark art. Today, we're discussing an importance of risk distribution for trade assets, why banks distribute them and why it's important for the market. A quick introduction to you both. Who are you? What is your background? And what is your current role? Thank you, Mark. I'm Nishat. I head the loan syndication, sales and distribution business for Mashrek Bank. Mashrek Bank is a large trade finance provider for a number of clients in um, GCC, Africa, Southeast Asia, and also operate out of uh, the major financial centers in US, UK and Hong Kong. As head of loan syndication, my role primarily is to get investors or get investor appetite for any loan or trade finance with Mashrek arranges. Thank you, Mark, and thanks, Nishit. So my name is Kamala Burhajayeva. I had America's distribution desk for JP Morgan based out of New York. I'm relatively new to New York. I've just moved there six months ago. And before that, I was heading the EMEA distribution desk based in London. Apparently, my journey started in banking back in 1996. I was predominantly in trade finance business and distribution. My journey was from Central Asia to Eastern Europe and then all the way to Middle East and back to Europe in UK. And now I'm in New York. I'm in charge of the distribution activities uh, for JP Morgan trade business. And as Nishit said, we are all in secondary market. We deal with the banks and we try to help the originators to do more. And of course, with a reduced risk and improving the returns. Going back to basics, Kamola, can you explain the role of distribution amongst trade finance banks? Why do banks distribute trade assets? Distribution plays a vital role in trade finance, as you know. There are multiple factors. Why do banks need to distribute the trade assets? Let's look at it. Distribution enables the banks, first of all, to manage their risk and then optimize their capital usage at times enhance liquidity and create extra capacity. And secondly, it's a great tool to front larger transactions and do complex structures to the client. So if we talk about basics, banks can use different risk mitigation tools and channels, and that's depending on their objective, of course. The other factors are risk management strategies, regulatory requirements at that time, and of course, market conditions. Given the current market conditions, the high base rates, increased liquidity premiums. I don't want to be very negative, but I'm just listing the common ones and RWA constraints the banks are facing. The role of distribution is becoming more and more critical and important. The most common way to distribute assets is very vanilla to risk participate with other banks under the master risk participation agreements. The assets can be distributed both funded or unfunded basis and also can be syndicated as a club deal. So if we talk about the distribution to financial institutions, which is a very basic way of risk distribution, there are benefits for all parties in this transaction. Of course, distributing bank improves their risk, reduces RWA if they're lucky, improves the returns, and also most importantly, as I mentioned, they can front large transaction. And on the other side, from participant bank, it's opportunity to deploy their limits and generate more revenues without any origination activities. And in case of a client, which is the obligor of a transaction, distribution enables them to invite their house banks to the transaction which is done by the leading bank. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. So that's on the vanilla risk participation structure. There are also other ways 
to distribute the risk, and that is uh, using the insurance. And we see more and more banks are entering the insurance area and they are using insurance as a risk mitigation tool. And also the multilateral development bank's role is key in the risk distribution activities. There are trade facilitation programs the multilateral development banks have, and those programs are specifically developed to support the trade flows to and from the emerging market countries or development countries. In my view, the guarantees of the multilateral development banks are one of the most efficient ways to do risk, from capital perspective at least. Thank you. And Nisha, in your panel session, it became apparent that banks distributing their trade assets has never been stronger. Can you explain why this is so? Sure, Mark. Uh, Thank you, Kamula, for great insights. See, I think uh, while we are talking about uh, financing here, uh, but I think the larger question here is the kind of world we are living in, unfortunately, uh, which is facing its own challenges. There are two issues which are really impacting the world and also trade finance. One is the macroeconomic situation, okay, where inflation has been extremely high. Because of that, the same quantum of goods, if we were probably importing a couple of years back, if we import it today, the value would be probably double of that. What this means is increased need for trade finance. On the other hand, to control inflation, the rates have been really high now for a while and the guidance also is not that great. So that is impacting the country ratings of a lot of emerging market countries in Africa, subcontinent and elsewhere, which means again reduce appetite for the originators, right? Because the country limits taking a hit. So the only way to bridge this gap of higher need but lower supply is through increased distribution. There is no other way. That's where I think uh, if I can talk about Mashrek perspective and Kamola touched upon it, we have you know moved away only from uh, bank market or distributing only to banks, although we have widened it and got a lot of smaller banks to follow us in a lot of markets. That is only now one third of our total distribution market. The remaining uh, two third is dominated by insurance as well as multilat. The major trend which uh, Kamola also touched upon briefly is that uh, the more rating gets downgraded and the more you move towards B minus or even triple C category, unfortunately, banks and insurance will start moving away. I mean, they don't have that kind of risk appetite. And that's where the development agenda of uh, multilaterals that comes to the fore. For us, for example, operating in countries like Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, and uh, Pakistan, we see a lot of support definitely or or a higher proportion of support coming from DFIs rather than the other two investors. Bank distribution is considered to be a restricted club relying on decade-old techniques. Why is this so and what do we need to do to change this? So one of the reasons can be that older people like us are still running this business. But uh, jokes apart, I think uh, there are Potentially two connotation of uh, when you say old technique. One, I think, is more bank-to-bank distribution. And second is the distribution being very manual in nature. So uh, let me take uh, both points one by one. So on the first point, I just touched upon that uh, while general view is that, you know, uh, trade asset is getting distributed only to banks, but I don't think that's any longer the case, especially in emerging market. I'll let Kamula talk about more... um, developed world or supply chain in US and Europe where the ratings are higher. Okay. But uh, from Mashrik perspective and given our reach and which is more an emerging market play, if you take out GCC, for us, as I mentioned, insurance and multilateral, they have made a big entry and they contribute now significantly to our distribution volume. The second part I think is more important. I highlighted that the need of trade finance is going up, which means volumes are going up. So, there is no way possibly, you know, that you can manage everything manually. There are a lot of, you know, paper exchanges, KYC, there are a lot of stuff which I don't think uh, can be managed manually any longer. From Ashrik also, we have realized this a uh, couple of years back and we are investing a lot in technology. We now have our own uh, 
digital platform okay which uh, we are using uh, to distribute trades the other positive impact of that would be that with so much data getting collected we are also working with our advanced analytics team to build uh, an overlay of analytics onto you know such huge data which is being generated on this digital platform and we think going forward it will be very useful maybe four or five year down the line when analytics can actually start providing a lot of guidance on how to do in which country Thank you. And Kamola, what's your perspective from JPM and North American distribution? And what are the general distribution trends that you're seeing? I can probably cover more, not only North America, but globally for JP Morgan distribution team. We definitely see new trends, new structures of the deals, new investor markets, and new players coming into the secondary market. As you know, trade distribution trends can vary from time to time, and that is depending on the various factors. Some being, I'll probably list few, the critical ones. Global economic landscape, change in the trade policies or the regulatory requirements, or advancement of technologies, as Nishit mentioned, and many more. There are multiple factors for the change in trends in the secondary market. So what we see now, there are more and more non-banking financial institutions coming into the market, and those are the trade finance companies or trade finance focused funds who wants to do probably similar role as the banks. They are both in risk distributing and also risk participating. The other one is, of course, um, non-financial institutions like institutional investors. Those can be asset managers, hedge funds, private equity firms. In my view, and Nishit uh, probably would agree, the interest coming from these new investors is due to the short-term nature of the trade assets and uh, low risk. You can still say trade is low risk and self-liquidating asset. We see these new investors find it as attractive asset to invest their money. Then I touched upon on the distribution structures. What we see is since the banks are looking at more structured, more complex deals and large ticket transactions, the trend is not just to do the risk participation under the master agreement, the trend is more to partner and do the club deals. Where it was not very common in the trade finance, it was more loan syndication structure when you syndicate a loan. But we see the trend of doing the trade syndications as well for large ticket transactions. Of course, digitalization is high in the agenda. The banks are partnering with the other trade finance companies to provide digitalized solutions to their clients. And uh, ESG is a hot topic. We see the investors are more and more interested to participate on ESG linked or ESG related programs and transactions, and that will help to meet their targets as well. So as I mentioned in the previous question, that it's a win-win situation for both banks, seller or participant. We hear a lot from the banks asking for ESG linked or related transactions. And we're also seeing a lot more interest from those alternative investors. I mean, a few things that we're seeing or, or our view is increases in base rates, questions around property, which was the stable asset class before, yes. the self-liquidating nature and relatively short term, and also inflation link at the moment, as Nishit said with prices and volumes where they are, there's a lot of this interest in the real asset economy of actually coming in and starting to participate and assisting there. So Kamala, can distribution moving trade assets away from banks balance sheets and freeing up more lendable capital help businesses access more trade and receivables finance? When we talk about distribution, it's always creating an extra capacity. Of course, it's the risk mitigation tool as well, but it is to create extra capacity. I agree. Yes, it does create capacity and the businesses, i.e. our clients, can definitely benefit from the bank being able to distribute and create capacity for them. The bank can not only redeploy the capital for larger or even do the multiple transactions, but at the same time, the banks give the opportunity for the client to bring on their other relationship banks into the program with the lead bank. It is, again, a win-win situation for everyone who is involved in a transaction. When you talk about the corporate distribution, it's always driven by the client and to talk to the relationship banks first before you go out to the market. I just wanted to touch upon on the receivables and inventory finance. 
again, distribution plays a key role in that because as you know that to set up a program like any payables, receivables, or inventory finance program for a bank and for the client as well, there is big operational process to set it up and also it's time consuming and also it comes as a cost. For this type of transactions, distribution is always part of value proposition. And in most cases, the banks, as I said, will consult with the client and select the participant banks into that program. So it is kind of allocating the client's capacity with the banks as well, just to bring on into one program. And Nishit, what trends are you seeing currently in the market from a MENA perspective? And as a result, is supply chain finance on the rise? Thank you, Mark. Yeah, so uh, I think from MENA perspective, we are definitely seeing a trend towards uh, supply chain finance picking up. As usual, it's not like every bank in MENA is trying to do that. From Mashrik perspective, I think we are definitely trying to take a lead on this, especially towards uh, financing a number of SMEs through more uh, innovative or alternate structures like uh, buyer-led supplier finance. Okay, where if an SME today, for example, goes and try and borrow, first of all, they may not get financing or even if they get, they will get it at a very prohibitive cost. Okay, so through these structures like BLSF, which is more like financing against invoices, which these SMEs have with uh, large corporate houses, we definitely try and first of all, build a bankable structure which can be distributed and secondly, bring down the price, okay, which overall helps the ecosystem and especially the SMEs. But these are not without challenges. I think these are early days. I think probably in uh, more developed markets, these are probably already working. There are, you know, a lot of operational issues around boarding uh, SMEs. There are legal aspects around uh, assignment of invoices in uh, countries where the legal system is continuously being strengthened. So while it is coming up, it's very, very prevalent. But do I think that this is the way to go in future? I think the answer is yes. And there again, I think the digital or fintechs are expected to play a large role, especially on, you know, getting these KYC things or onboarding uh, aspect sorted. We are working with a few uh, fintechs and I am sure there is a lot of work going around that. But once it is sorted, then I believe this is the way to go to go about. And let's talk about alternative lending or investing, which is a hot topic at IP for Abu Dhabi this year. Nishir, how has the trend towards alternative investors and new investors affected Mashrek Bank strategies, especially with the increasing demand for non-traditional financing options? I think there are, again, you talk about um, alternate investor as well as uh, alternate finance. So let me first touch upon um, alternate investor, which I would assume will mean anyone apart from banks. I think Kamola touched upon uh, interest coming from a lot of funds or private equity fund or NBFIs into trade finance structure. Are we really seeing that in um, our part of the world? I think maybe a little bit, but not to a very large extent. But are we, would we want such an investor class to develop for sure. And it again goes back to my initial point around the trade finance requirement gap getting widened and widened. So from our perspective, it will welcome more and more uh, investors coming in and deploying funds. The only alternate investor, again, I mean, from our strategy point of view, which we have seen really supporting trade finance and in difficult countries remain um, insurance and multilaterals. On the second aspect on um, relative uh, financing, I think, yeah, we see, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, requirement getting generated. For example, I talked about BLSFs or Biolet Supplier Finance, which is supporting SMEs. We see a lot of these prepayment structures, which are again, structured trade in nature, happening quite a lot. In fact, for Mashrek, we also have a trade company called Shuruk, which is based in DMCC in Dubai, through which we have done close to $10 billion of prepayments. Why it helps? Because, you know, these are done on the back of some firm of take contracts. And the only risk what Mashrek takes is performance risk on supplier, which is very different from, you know, providing a loan. If we feel confident that uh, the entity availing prepayment would be able to supply against a firm contract to, say, some high-rated uh, off-takers, 
then we are happy to do set structured stuff. It's not that we have only, when I talk about $10 million, it's not that we are keeping everything in our book. So more than 60 to 70% of that has been successfully distributed to banks in Asia as well as in Middle East. So we see that trend uh, happening more and more because these are again innovative and alternate way to make the financing more bankable. And Nisha, given trade assets are generally self-liquidating, short-term, low-risk assets, what are the main pain points and challenges in growing this asset class? And can distribution help bridge the $2.5 trillion trade finance gap? So I think the distribution probably is the only way through which uh, this gap can be bridged. I touched upon a bit on this in our panel. So probably, you know, there are certain uh, investor base which are already heavily invested in um, to this asset class, which is banks or multilabs or, or insurance. We have seen some structures being uh, done on a portfolio basis, maybe with an insurance wrap, or we hear about it. It's not very prevalent in MENA, but in European market, uh, we have heard about structures uh, being done on a portfolio basis with insurance wrap, which are then targeted to funds, whether it is pension fund or some hedge funds. The issue, again, because what I feel is that operationalizing such structure is a bit tricky because these are very short term in nature. So if and if you are trying to create, uh, say, a loan of for example, for three to four years, underlying trade asset is getting liquidated in six month time. You need to keep on replenishing uh, the right kind of asset into the SPV or whatever is being used to facilitate this, which has its own challenges. Uh, one is origination, which is still manageable, but then second for every asset to be put into any SPV would require a lot of due diligence from KYC perspective, from sanctions perspective and other aspects. So I think there is a lot of work to be done, but is this something which needs to be developed to bridge the gap? Again, my response will be yes, but we have to find out the right way. I think we've understood from today, distribution is the right way forward. We've got to increase it and there's new investors which are coming into the market. That was a great podcast highlighting the importance of and the role of distribution amongst trade banks. Thank you, Nishit Kamola, for joining me on Trade Finance Talks at IPFA's 49th Annual Trade and Forfeiting Conference here in Abu Dhabi. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.